do something, we have to try to do it. Before I, introduce, before I introduce today's distinguished guests, I've been asked to make two very brief announcements. First of all, the Faculty Peace Committee is holding a conference this Friday and Saturday on the social responsibility of the intellectual. All meetings will be held in Wheeler Auditorium beginning on Friday evening at 8 p.m. as the youngest man to win the Nobel Peace Prize, winning it at the age of 35. At the present time, in addition to his civil rights activities, he's been one, one of the leading critics of President Johnson's war policy. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you very kindly for your heartwarming applause. Someone has said that when an audience applauds you before you speak, uh, that represents faith. When they applaud in the middle of your speech, that represents hope. And when they applaud at the end, that represents love. <laughs> so you have demonstrated great faith today, and I certainly want to appreciate I uh, yield very heartwarming applause. I need not pause to say how very delighted I am to have the privilege of coming to this great institution of learning and the privilege of discussing with you some of the vital issues of our day. No one can overlook the fact that the University of California is one of the truly great universities of our world. I think one of the great needs in our world today, and certainly in our nation, is for the revolution of values. And I, for one, appreciate the fact that you here at Berkeley have constantly reminded all of us and our whole nation that we must rev review our values. And I would also like to express my deep personal appreciation to you as a civil rights leader for the support that you as a university and a concerned student body have given to the civil rights struggle. As we there can be no gain saying of the fact that America has brought the nation and the world to an awe-inspiring threshold of the future. We have built machines that think and instruments that peer into the unfathomable ranges of interstellar space. We have built gigantic buildings to kiss the skies and gargantuan bridges to span the seas. Through our spaceships, we have carved the highways through the stratosphere, 
Through our airplanes, we've dwarfed distance and placed time in chains. And through our submarines, we have penetrated oceanic depths. And this is a dazzling picture of our nation's scientific and technological progress. But when we look to the other side, something basic is missing. Our nation suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit, which stands in glaring contrast to our scientific and technological abundance. Yes, we've learned to fly the air like birds. We've learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet we have not learned the simple art of walking the earth as brothers and sisters. Henry David Thoreau talked once about improved means to an unimproved end. And so often we have allowed the means by which we live. We talk about this afternoon evils that must be dealt with and problems that must be solved if we are to go on positively and creatively in the days ahead. Racial injustice is still the black man's burden and America's shame. This problem exists today because many Americans would like to have a nation which is a democracy for white Americans, but simultaneously a dictatorship over black Americans. This is one of the great problems that we find today. Now, in the struggle to get rid of racial injustice, there has been some progress, and I would not want to overlook this. For in assault after assault, the movement has profoundly shaken the entire edifice of legal segregation. And I need not go into the movements from the Montgomery bus boycott right on up through the Selma movement of 1965, movements which literally subpoenaed the conscience of a large segment of the nation to appear before the judgment seat of morality on the whole question of civil rights. But in spite of this, we must recognize that the plant of freedom has grown only a bud and not yet a flower. We must see that the struggle is much more difficult now. For well now 12 years, the civil rights struggle dealt with the system of legal segregation and the syndrome of deprivation and exploitation surrounding this system. Many things were done during those years that we will remember as long as the cords of memory shall lengthen. But what we must see today is that with Selma and the Voting Rights Act, one phase of development in the Civil Rights Revolution came to an end. Now a new phase has opened. This new phase is a struggle for genuine equality. Now, in the phase that has now passed, the achievements were obtained at bargain rates. It didn't cost the nation anything to integrate lunch counters. No expenses were involved. No taxes were involved. It didn't cost the nation anything to integrate libraries, motels, and hotels. It didn't cost the nation anything to guarantee the right to vote. 
Now we are dealing with issues that will cost the nation something in terms of billions of dollars. And the other thing that we must see is that we are now dealing with issues that will demand a radical redistribution of economic and political power. <laughs> the allies who went with us in the first phase are going in this phase. Many of the people. meant that America was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor while refusing to undergird its black peasants who were brought here in chains from Africa with the same kind of economic floor. And therefore, emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger. It was freedom to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without bread to eat without land to cultivate. It was freedom and famine at the same time. In 1875, the nation passed a civil rights bill and refused to enforce it. In 1964, the nation passed an even weaker civil rights bill. And even to this day, it has not been enforced in all of its dimensions. In 1954, the Supreme Court declared segregation unconstitutional in the public schools. And now we find ourselves 12 or 13. <laughs> and so we must not allow anybody to take our eyes from the real problem. There were no chance of black power when four innocent, unoffending, beautiful Negro girls were killed in a church in Birmingham, Alabama, and nothing has been done about it to this very day. We must see the problem where it is. The problem is that white America, and I don't mean all white Americans, but white America has never solidly committed itself on the question of racial justice. And it means that now we must gird our courage. And those who are committed to the struggle for justice and freedom must work harder than ever before. For I assure you that we need this kind of activity and this kind of work more than we had it even in the first phase. I know that we're going through a period where there are understandable suspicions in some segments of the Negro community. Consensus octopus. It extends its nagging prehensile tentacles in villages and cities all over our nation. Time and in the same breath, contend that they are not racist. All of these things reveal that the white back backlash is nothing new. The fact is that America has been backlashing on the question of fundamental human rights for its black citizens for more than 300 years. Years later, with less, with less than 5% of the Negro students of the Deep South attending integrated schools, and if it continues at this pace, it will take another 97 years to integrate the public schools of the South. Suburban politicians talk eloquently against open housing and at the same time, <laughs> Some 40 million of our brothers and sisters are poverty stricken. Many of them go to bed hungry at night. I've seen them with my own eyes. I've lived with them in the ghettos of our nation. Some of them are Indians. Some are Mexican-American. Some are Puerto Rican. Some are Appalachian whites. 
the largest group in terms, in proportion to its size and the population is the American Negro. Negroes and poor people generally find themselves today smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. Now something must be done about this. Something must be done about it quickly. When we look at the Negro community, for an instance, we are facing a major depression every day. The unemployment rate among Negroes is set forth by the Labor Department at 8.4 percent. Unemployment in the nation generally is about 4 percent. But they don't deal with all of the facts because they are dealing with statistics that can be gathered as a result of people who've been in the labor market and those who still go to the employment office to try to find work. They are dealing with the hundreds and thousands of discouraged Negroes, many of whom have lost hope. They've had so many doors closed in their faces. They've come to conclude that life is a long and desolate corridor with no exit sign. They've lost motivation. There may be another 7 or 8 percent in that category, which means that the unemployment rate among Negroes may well be 16 percent. Among some young people, among the youth in the Negro community in some cities, it goes up as high as 35 and 40 percent. If the nation as a whole confronted what the Negro is presently confronting economically, we would be in a major depression more staggering than the depression of the 30s. And it's not only unemployment. Most of the poor people are working every day but earning so little money. I estimated the other day that we spend $500,000 to kill every enemy soldier in Vietnam. And when you look at the other side, it's tragic. We spend only $53 a year for every person that's considered poverty-stricken, and half of that goes for salaries for those who are not poor. And the question is, what are we trying to win today? I'm afraid that the administration of our nation is more concerned about winning an unwinnable war in Vietnam than about winning the war against poverty right here at home. <laughs> now this leads me to the next evil. It is the evil of war. Nowhere does this evil express today more than in the tragic, unjust, evil war in Vietnam. It's tragic that we got in it from the very beginning. As Professor Cominger has said, this tragic war is a product of a gigantic miscalculation that the world after 1945 was and would remain divided into two great blocks, one representing light and the other darkness, <laughs> and that we who represented the light stood at Armageddon and battle for the Lord. Somehow, we moved right on with those miscalculations. This war is the product of a gigantic miscalculation about China and about Asia, probably the largest and most fearful miscalculation in diplomatic history. The notion that Chiang Kai-shek represented the true China, <laughs> that the communists did not represent China, and were not really here to stay and need not therefore be recognized 
It was as if Britain and France had gone on recognizing the Confederacy as the legitimate government of the United States 20 years after Appomattox. It is the product of an almost demonic delusion that we were not only called upon to set and keep the rest of the world straight, but that we had the material, intellectual, and moral resources to do this. It is a product of grave miscalculations that because we were a world power, we had power and could use it everywhere in the world. And out of this melancholy body of obsessions and miscalculations have come those notions now so familiar that we, not the United Nations, are the peacekeeping instrument of the modern world. Once accept these assumptions, assumptions almost paranoid in their sweeping vastness, and our war in Vietnam takes on a kind of nightmarish logic. This war has all of the dimensions of a Greek tragedy. And oh, it has done so much damage to our nation. Vietnam and ending that war of venal in the next time to come home from Vietnam. Another casualty of the war in Vietnam is the humility of our nation. Through rugged determination, scientific and technological uh, progress, as I mentioned earlier, we have become the richest and most powerful nation in the world. But honestly impels me to admit that our power has often made us arrogant. We feel that our money can do anything. We arrogantly feel that we have everything to teach other nations and nothing to learn from them. We often arrogantly feel that we have some divine messianic mission to police the whole world. We are arrogant in not allowing young nations to go through the same growing pains turbulence and revolution that characterized our own history. We are arrogant in our contention that we have some sacred mission to protect people from totalitarian rule while we make little use of our power to end the evils of South Africa and Rhodesia. How are the problems facing our nation and facing mankind. And the other thing about this war in Vietnam is that it has increased the possibilities of all-out nuclear warfare, and therefore it, is, it has increased the possibilities of the destruction of all mankind. And I must say to you honestly this afternoon, and I'm sad to say it, but I fear that the clouds of the Third World War are hovering mighty low. And if there is a Third World War which can destroy the whole of mankind, our government will have to take the chief responsibility for making this a reality. talking with people about the war in Vietnam, giving them the facts 
about the war, developing statistics on the number of people opposed to the war. And the aim is to build a powerful peace bloc that can really have influence in the 1968 elections. And we must make it clear that we aren't going to let our political forces and the politicians ignore Vietnam in 1968. This must be an issue if that tragic war is still going on. And so as the war hawks escalate the war in Vietnam, we must escalate our protest against the war. said to me the other day, Dr. King, don't you think you're hurting your influence? Don't you think by taking a stand against the war in Vietnam, you are losing many people who once respected you? They will no longer listen to you now? Don't you think you must kind of move back, go more toward the administration's policy? And I looked at this reporter and said, I'm sorry, sir, but you don't know me. I'm not a consensus leader. <laughs> As I move toward my conclusion, let me say that there is a need in our country for a kind of creative discontent. There are certain technical words that are used in every academic discipline. They soon become stereotypes and cliches. Every academic discipline has its technical nomenclature. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. <laughs> and certainly we all want to live as far as possible the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. <laughs> but I must say to you this afternoon that there are some things in, in, our, in our nation and in the world of which I'm proud to be maladjusted to which I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism. But in a day when Sputniks and explorers and Geminis are dashing throughout a space and guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win if that is a world war. And we must come to see now that the alternative to disarmament, the alternative to a greater suspension of nuclear tests, the alternative to strengthening the United Nations and thereby disarming the whole world may well be a civilization plunged into the abyss of annihilation and our earthly habitat will be transformed into an inferno that even the mind of Dante could not envision. It may well be that our world is in dire need of a new organization, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. <laughs> desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. And somehow, I still have faith 
that keeps me going through these difficult days. I hope that we will develop the coalition of conscience and will solve this problem. I'll tell you why I have the faith, and it is because of universities like this, with thousands of young people, black and white, who have the new vision that we need in this age. And so I haven't lost faith in the future. I think we are going to reach the goal that we seek. And so I can still sing, we shall overcome. I know many can't sing it now, but I can still sing it because I believe the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We shall join hands right in this nation and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last.